So in this episode, we talk about our journeys through education, our own personal journey, and also that journey, uh, and also our journey as parents, now raising the next generation and discussing different education options like self-directed learning, Montessori, public school system. The Becoming Da Vinci Show is sponsored by The Kinetic Experience, where entrepreneurs come for community, growth, education, and to make even more money. So to learn more about The Becoming Da Vinci Show, visit us at www.becomingdavinciShow.com, where you can learn all sorts of stuff about Leonardo da Vinci and what we are doing to correlate his life and his example with modern-day entrepreneurs and self-directed learning. Becoming Da Vinci, Da Vinci. Welcome, welcome. This is episode, or just like a mini episode, another mini episode, episode, mini episode number two, which is, uh, we wanted to share our journey in education. Yes. So again, my name is Abe Nadimi. I'm Janica Morton. And I will just tell you my brief story. Uh, I was born a genius and <laughs> I've been held back by the man ever since. <laughs> Not sure. So I grew up, well, I'm pretty sure born. Oh, whatever. I mean, extremely Get on good with looking. It. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> so my story is that I was born uh, in Iran, grew up here in Texas, uh, went to uh, K through 12 in Texas. So I did a little bit of time north of uh, Amarillo in a little town called Pampa, I believe, or Parrington. I always get that mixed up. So I went through kindergarten and first grade there. And then in second grade, moved to Arlington and did second through 12th grade in Arlington. So going through a traditional education, uh, K through 12. Did you flirt with the teachers the whole time? Tell them to, all sorts of stuff to give you good grades? It's called emotional intelligence uh, uh-huh. and sales. Yeah. Right. Always make sure make sure that the teacher's on your side. Mm-hmm. So yes, definitely. And I remember <laughs> I got in trouble in seventh grade and the teacher just brought me outside and said, Abe, hey, what's going on? You never act like this. What's happening? And that made me feel so bad that I never <laughs> messed up in her class again. That's all she had to say. <laughs> I was I was like the mastermind instigator though on some other crazy stuff. Yeah, I believe that. With 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 a gen- with a gentleman, one of one of my prime like greatest stories. Uh, that person is not like a vice principal or a principal of a school in Irving. So it's really funny how this works out that some of the people that you cause ruckus with going through school turn around and actually are now still in education. And now they're in the admin side, which I think is crazy. Anyway, so after uh, graduated Lamar uh, and then went to get a four-year degree in electrical engineering. What is Lamar? Lamar High School. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, sorry, sorry. For all you people who don't know Lamar High School in Arlington, Texas. No. Sorry. Anyways. So, yeah, that's my story. And uh, well, I have a daughter who is now uh, 13. And obviously, I was very involved with her school as she's you know going through uh, daycare and making sure we pick a daycare that really helped her learn skills like reading and letters and numbers and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and then she went through kindergarten, and I want to say was I think she was going into the second grade or so when I got to do the math really fast, but I want to say it's something like that where I started to read about. Uh, our upcoming son. So I was kind of freaked out because we were going to have a boy and I had like no idea how to be a boy dad in a sense, right? <laughs> so I had a, like I said, I, I had a girl and nor was going to be nine at the time when, when Issa was born. So I thought like, oh my God, great. what am I going to do with this, you know, with, with this new creature in the house, this little boy, because I'm not mm-hmm. about digging holes and chasing down worms and bugs. <laughs> so in that process, I ended up reading a book called Free to Learn, which was by Dr. Peter Gray. And it talks about unschooling and uh, the Sudbury School mm-hmm. in, I think it's Massachusetts. Pens- Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay. So up to that time, I was doing like the brown dad thing with my daughter, where it's like she comes home and we do homework and I'm right there with her on doing the homework and uh, doing extra, extra work because that's what we do. We do extra work. We do especially extra math work, right? And all of a sudden, I, I started to respect her per- personal journey through education. And I laid off all of those things, which is really difficult, even sometimes for me now. So, um, and now we have a four-year-old. And well, that Issa is now four years old. I think I said that already. And that kid is so rambunctious, uh, as Janica has taught us to say, 
He's empowered. He's empowered and memorable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, you know, thinking through putting him in a school, what kind of school would be best for him? Let me turn. Let me say it a different way. What kind of educational environment would be best mm-hmm. for him? Right? right. And so that's where it's to us. It seems to be some idea of when we think about personalizing his education, it would be around uh, him being able to to be physically free to move around because he's so active and also allowing him to explore different interests. Yeah. So that's my, that's my story of education so far, but I know yours is way, way more interesting. Wow. You didn't say something about the dinosaur ages or anything. But that's what I'm saying. It's more interesting. (laughs) So like there was, you were there when the books came out. (laughs) Yeah. I got to see it all. Um, I would say that, Looking back at my childhood, the year that made the most impact was when I was in Montessori. And I don't know if that was preschool or kindergarten, might have been two years. I just remember so much of it and being like empowered (laughs) to think through and do what I wanted to do. Whereas when I went into first grade, I was in a private Christian school, pretty much the rest of my education. Um, And I excelled at it because that's who I was, but I was bored and questioned all the time. Why do we need this? This is stupid. Like I didn't see the, the value to anything I was learning. Um, and so when in high school, um, I decided to, to do my junior and senior year in one year so I could get into college, just to keep going, figure out what else was next. So I did that. And in college, I took a class called the Humanities Honors Program, and it was like a it was like a whole program for two years. And that opened up the door to all sorts of different philosophies and studying everything you can imagine from Dante to, well, Leonardo da Vinci. And we studied everything that was out there, a lot of art history, a lot of history. Um, and so when I went, when I was done with school, I, I, well, I jumped in to become an accountant thought because I liked spreadsheets. It was fun. I was going to be an accountant and there was security in that. Whatever. Shut up. <laughs> I really want to make a joke about you thinking you should have been an accountant, but yeah, I know that's not what we're doing here. So very serious, very serious. So then, um, I was like two semesters or yeah, two semesters, one semester from getting my degree. So I had an accounting, it was going to have an accounting degree and a finance degree with this honors program degree that I already had. And I went into an internship and I was like, fuck, this sucks. I'm not doing this. So was it the job or was it the environment? Both. Like, okay. Both. I was just like, I lasted three weeks. I think at the end of the first week, I was like, I, I, I don't want to go to work next week. No. Mm -mm." And it was a full summer internship and I quit after three weeks. It's just done. And so then that August, that was like into June. And then August, um, a friend told me about web development and web design. So I just went to the library and got books and learned all about web development and web design and got on the internet and found a web page I liked and recreated it and learned all of that, learned all the programming and stuff, and then started that that year um, working for Bay Networks. And through that, I learned all about self-directed learning like I had such a fascination with it and and was so passionate about it it took my analytical side and my creative side and combined it into one thing so it was perfect for me so I grew that so then when when I had kids I kept thinking back to Montessori and how I loved it so for the listeners at home can you actually describe what Montessori is yes Montessori is a form of education it was created by Maria Montessori and um, about a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago. And the focus is on letting children learn in their natural way within the structure of, uh, manipulatives and, um, a, a very loose curriculum. So there, she developed a curriculum from three years old through, I believe it's 13, somewhere, wherever sixth grade lands. And it is, They use manipulatives in a holistic manner. So with one manipulative, say, a uh, um, a, uh, the letter 
the letter blocks that you then trace. So they start with tracing them with their finger. They might take that letter form and put it into sand and they trace it in the sand. And then the next time they're going to use chalk and trace it, or they're going to use a pencil and then they're going to actually use the form there and then they're going to move with their finger over here. And then they're going to just start with a pencil or whatever. So it's, it's growing not only their, their ability with their hands, their dexterity, but also using the tools and manipulatives. And so then they take that form and then they add another one. So they have an S and then they take an A and an M. And so they create words from it and they're, but it's, so it is structured or it's not structured. It's not structured in the sense that you have to do X, Y, and Z in this order. It's let me give you a lesson on how to use the manipulative. Then you play with it to the extent that you, you want to until you're bored. Okay. That makes sense. And then you go on to another, Mm mm-hmm. What do you call it? Manipulative? Ma- manipulative, yes, or module, or it depends on okay. on who teaches it, what it's called. But So they can learn at any age anything. So a three-year-old, like like Grant was doing long division at in when he was three, four, and five. He didn't know that. We didn't know that until we sat down and realized what he was doing with the manipulatives, that it was long division. Um, and same with writing sentences. And, and structuring, they're structuring it with their different manipulatives, and they don't know that, oh, this is a verb, this is a noun. They don't realize that, but they know, oh, this piece does action in this, right, because of the way, way it's all interactive. So when my oldest was three and we were looking at schools, I went back to looking at what schools I liked. So I researched all the schools in DFW area, so we just moved here, and I didn't know anything about it, and found a Montessori school. And uh, we interviewed at a couple of Montessori schools, and we ended up letting Scotty choose the one, and he loved it, um, excelled at it. He was able to combine his creativity and his um, deep love for stories and just read and create through that. Um, And then our other three went through Montessori. So when Scotty was finishing third grade, um, we realized that spending $40,000 a year was just not smart. (laughs) to be doing (laughs) so we looked at uh other alternatives and the older two uh we went and interviewed at public schools and we we interviewed at private schools too and uh felt that that wasn't the right solution for them so we looked at homeschooling and um through trial and error found that for my children I felt that the best option was for them to direct their own learning so at one point, I think it was 2014, I just went hands off and let them do what they wanted to do. They hung from trees. They swam all day. They played video games. They did math problems. They read and read and read. Um, my younger two learned to read and spell and write sentences through playing Minecraft. Um, all three of the younger ones have dyslexia, and so they didn't read until they were around 9 or 10 anyway. So at one point I realized that they really needed a community to bounce ideas off of. And I tried different options of bringing lots of families over, one or two families, and the kids would just explore and learn together. And that worked out great, but it was not to the extent that they wanted. And the older two were getting really bored with being at home. So in January of 2015, I met Danella Secretly online and she introduced me to Erin Yang, and then that August, we launched the Macarios Community School, which is a self-directed democratic free school, where the kids get to, um, it's for ages 5 to 18, and the kids get to learn what they want to learn, when they want to learn it. Um, they have a vote, in, and there's a, they have a vote in the school, and there is a judicial system, so there are the rules that they implement, there's a whole system that goes along, and it follows Robert's Rules of Order, which is what the, the court our court system uses. Um, now they offer different curriculums and they offer uh, classes that the kids can sign up for and take. So it's grown a lot since then. I was really surprised when I learned about self-directed learning because uh, initially it sounds so free. And at the same time, because the fact that in the community type schools like Macario's, the, the students vote together and with the adults on crafting the the rules, the structure for that particular school based on their personalities. And, and I think that's a really fascinating, mm-hmm. really, really fascinating um, thought because I remember going through school and not obviously having much of a voice. 
right? And the things are just laid out and they're not necessarily known as to why these are rules. Some rules make sense some rules don't, right? right? And some rules that didn't make sense, I need to know the history as to why they even put them in place. And, uh, and then when I learned about the, the democratic schools where they actually can go and put in a vote and say, for example, you can't wear tie dye here, <laughs> which I think should totally no be a rule. No one would do that. Should totally be a rule. Uh, nonetheless, right. They put a rule, they follow it, everybody votes. And I guess at some point if they don't like it, they can re ring it up. Mm-hmm. Right. Vote. There's amendments. Yeah. It's just like the constitution. So that's what I, that was the interesting part of the self-directed learning. It doesn't necessarily mean there's no structure. It doesn't mean that there's no curriculums. It doesn't mean any of those things because it can, they can include some of those elements. And so that's really the beauty, beautiful part, right? Well, it's I, self-directed. It's so exactly. if they want structure, they can put as much structure as they want into it. So for whatever reason, and I'm guilty of it too, when I first heard self-directed, it immediately sounds like it's the Wild West, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody does whatever they want. You know, the toughest, baddest kid makes makes everything happen or does what they want to do. And that's Anarchy. N- yeah, there you go, anarchy. <laughs> that is not the case. No. Right? So I, would, I remember specifically visiting in your school and I was greeted at the door and by Spider-Man, <laughs> like uh, yes. full blown Spider-Man. Yes. Uh, but in other places, the kids were completely, um, structured. I don't know. You know, they Focused. were, they were sitting down together and they were working on a focused activity yeah. together. Yeah. And then later on I saw Spider-Man join in one of the focus groups. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was, that was really fascinating. And so that's one version. And then, you know, different levels of that, I guess, um, I think, have you found that different schools have different ways to implement that type of the self-directed piece? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's just within limits. Like how free are they going to let them be and how free the, if there's a vote, like if it's a democratic school where they have a vote, how, how, what the rules are that are put into place. But then you have like, even Montessori is considered self-directed to an extent, even though it's not, Right. Be- yeah, because it's somewhat self-directed. Yeah, within- it is within the within the module that you're learning. Right. Yeah. So, like tying this full circle to becoming Da Vinci, what do you? So, for me, when I think of Leonardo Da Vinci, I do think of that element of him as a very young child getting to explore different things, mm-hmm. uh, getting to take pieces of paper that were sitting around from his dad, essentially stealing paper, which was really rare 500 years ago. Right. Right. And then going out and making drawings and so forth with it. Right. And then also, but then in the more structured environment of an apprenticeship, which Mm -hmm. obviously based on his, you know, who he's doing an apprenticeship under what is going on, he has to, you know, conform to. Right. You know, that project or whatever that job was going on. So it's that transition. So I thought that's a really interesting, do you have the similar realization where when you look at Da Vinci, how do you tie that based on what you know of creating a school and based on raising your kids and in alternative forms of education? Cause some of your kids actually went back to public school. Yeah. So I think it just goes down to Da Vinci had the freedom to follow his interests. And so he did, and he had natural talents in a lot of areas and was able to build on those. Um, and then in that, I think, I mean, looking back on it now from what I understand of Da Vinci, he, he took the path that was the easiest for him in the apprenticeship for painting, um, even though that wasn't his passion. So it, there was this level of, of, of almost um, that low-hanging fruit thing of this is where I can excel and succeed and get a niche in and make money versus this is my passion. So he was directing his whole life experience in a way that um, made sense for him to grow outside of the limitation that he was in. So I think with, like with my kids, they've done the same thing. Um, Evan wanted to experience something new. He felt that it was better for his life experience to go to a public school and to experience that and to be challenged um, from the social aspect to the, to the schoolwork. And he did it and he excelled at it. And then he chose, I don't need to go back. I've already experienced it. So now he's on a different path. Um, Grant wanted to play football and chase girls. That's what he's doing. (laughs) 
<laughs> and, and excelling at all and, and academically. And academically, yes. So I think that they're in for both of them, their drive and will. And I, I'm not saying every kid could could spend their grammar school level without any education and be able to go into school and get straight A's. Those two have, and they did, I think for a couple of reasons. One, they're just, they've always known how to learn. Right. They, they know how to research. They know how to figure things out. They, they did the homework. They did what was required of them, but they wanted to, there wasn't resistance. They wanted to learn and they wanted to be there. And that's a huge thing. Cause I think that there's kids today that are in the public school system or a private school system who have, um, who could just get straight A's and they don't, they don't care. What I think is really interesting is that self-directed learning can include, encompasses public education if that's so, if that's what a child wants to do. Mm-hmm. In a sense, you were just mentioning Grant, for example, right now is in a public school system. Right. And he directed his involvement there. Yep. I right. made him beg for two years to go. Nonetheless. Yep. He's there. He did. He, he, he spoke up and decided, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's not that it's one or the other necessarily. And that's no. where, that's where I, 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 and I know... Um, you love this term too, which is personalized education Mm -hmm. more so than any one specific. It's that we live in a time and there's so many different options available that we can personalize the education to a child, even inside of a public school system. If that's, if that's what's going on. Right. And I think that would be better. Can you personalize an education inside a public school system? I think if you look at Finland, you'll see examples of that. Okay. Yeah. So for me, you know, it's not, I'm not against any one particular system as much as I'm, I, I'm for uh, modes of operation that are more conducive to what a child is, an interest, is naturally interested in and their learning pace and so forth. So I don't think, for example, a super artistic kid must learn pre-calculus. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Now on the other side, you know, I... I I'm, I was more on the analytic side, so I did the biology and the geometry, and you know I did pre-cal, I did Cal one in high school, but that was my path, mm-hmm. right? Why does that have to be the path necessarily for most people or all people? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And we live at a time where we can personalize these things. And yes, it may take more involvement. Uh, it may take more involvement from the curriculum style or whatever, right? Because I know how hard it is. Self-directed learning doesn't mean that the parents can just sit on the couch. Right, it's involving them into providing them opportunities. No, you are super involved, <laughs> and I know Tangi, you know who who does so yeah. many things with Isa, and he's only four. Is constantly trying to figure out new ways to stimulate, get him things that he's interested in. When he asks about, for example, if he asks about dolphins, figure out what videos to show him, what you know where to go. Strewing, so that's that's a big part when they're little. Definitely is, and there is so much more involvement because you have to give them the opportunities and the exposure so that they can figure out what they want to learn more about. Right. And as they get older, yeah, you can sit on the couch and watch them go. (laughs) And one thing I really loved in the Macario school, and I've learned about other, you know, progressive schools, is that they allow the ages to mix more. Yeah, it's key. It's really awesome because I remember um, we have a foreign exchange student right now that's living with us, and she is from South Korea. Mm-hmm. South Korea is doing really well and it's ranked really high when it comes down to education. And she was absolutely surprised at A, how much interaction she has with students and students of other grades. And, I, and I'm just like, what are you talking about? Because, you know, in eighth grade, you only hang around eighth graders, right? Right. And she's in ninth grade. So she said what happens is primarily they sit in one classroom and the teacher cycle through. Yeah. So there is no, none of this passing period where you can interact. So she's like, oh, my God, I get to interact so much with all these people of different ages. So talk about perspective. So take it a step further. Wow. And I remember, you know, again, visiting Macario's or reading about other schools like that where the kids can mm-hmm. blend in age, which is really interesting because the kids naturally, the older kids naturally change their personality and change how they act when they have younger kids around. Yes and no. So if you look at Montessori, that was the whole point is to have three year blocks because you start as as the the young one and you're basically thought of like you're the sponge and everything around you you're going to learn from. And then you have the middle one where they're they're learning and they're teaching and whatever. And then you have the, the third year one, which is supposed to be teaching down. But what is fascinating to me is when you would go and sit in one of those classrooms, 
you could have the three-year-old teaching the six-year-old. Wow. Or, you know, the, the five-year-old teaching the, the three-year-old or six-year-old, whatever. They could be working together and collaborating together. And, you know, my kids had, you know, uh, from CASA through kindergarten or through primary, you have three to six-year-olds. So they could have their best friend could be three when they're five. Sure. You don't know any different. You're, sure. you're interacting, you're teaching, you're learning, you're, you're growing together. It's such sure. a wider variety. And, and especially I think it's so much more beneficial for the younger ones to be exposed to that and they're not limited. And what, what I really like about it is the, for me, when I think about changes in the school system that could be more supportive of this kind of personalized education, mm-hmm. I think of how much, how much better it would be for the teachers because the teachers are working their tails off. Yeah. Right. Trying to match all these curriculum, I think in Texas they're called TEKS, which right. seem to be like the, the amount, the, the things that they have to cover in a, in a school year. But they're, they're forced to cover specific things and specific timelines mm-hmm. instead of adjusting, allow, allowing, allowing the teachers to know, showing up, caring for the students, giving them love and attention is number one, the most yeah. important thing that you can do, which which they're doing that and it's not even required of them in a sense, right? Right. But just doing that is so amazing. And then with the tools and resources to foster the personalized education, Mm -hmm. right? Which so much stuff is now available online. Right. And through the devices that are available, like the Chromebooks that so many schools have, there is an opportunity instead of it being so rigid, Right. Right. And I think that's wearing that that's put so much pressure on the teachers. And I think that's really unfair for them. And and also puts all that pressure back to the system. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if it's so structured, then you should have like an assembly line. Right. Because you go to a Toyota assembly line where they know in so many minutes a car needs to pop out at the other end. Or you go through if you're trying to look at the school system like that, like, well, sure, by this age, they should know these things. And if they don't know these things, that means you weren't doing your job. But that's not necessarily true either. No, I, I got a letter this last week from, from the school that Grant's at or the district or whatever saying that he, they sent this chart and it showed he'd been, he'd missed three days of school. So he was, they were worried he was going to fail eighth grade. And I, I outright laughed because I was like, oh my gosh, he hasn't gone to school for how many years? I really don't think it matters. <laughs> Obviously <laughs> like, not. But I can see how in their thing, they're like, oh no, because now I've got to catch him up in this and this and this and this and this. So that he stays on this path, this curriculum that they're so set on, that is arbitrary. That's right. And it's the same same way when it comes to work. And that's why companies like 37 Signals, they have a completely mm-hmm. remote workforce. Which right. is hard. Like, I don't know how to manage that 100% at all. Right? But there are companies that are doing it and that are thriving. And they're, yeah. You know, they have millions and millions of dollars of sales. And they run based on this is what's required by this time and let's communicate on it. So if that's, that's one great. extreme for an, for adults, why does it not apply to children? So I think that's that's the that's the beautiful thing. And then we tie it all back to Da Vinci. Well, primarily that's how he did his education. Well, and that's how entrepreneurs do. They exactly. have to be self directed and they have to control their time and manage their time and, and everything within it. So I can't imagine an entrepreneur being successful being stuck in an office all day and being controlled and told of what he's going to do, how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it, or she. And all that. Or I'm, she. I mean, come on now. I'm just joking. Whatever. No, but it's true, and that's why that's why it's so important for us to have these conversations because we are so interested uh, on the entrepreneurial front, and we right. know that if if it works for an entrepreneur, um, then it should work for the, as an adult. It should we should have looked at their their background and figure out if we had changed things for this entrepreneur, right? For entrepreneurs in general the five-year-old entrepreneur who's like trying to sell candy, mm-hmm. right? And then I think we'll foster more entrepreneurs, which really all that means is that when it comes down to a seven-year-old, 10-year-old, it's are we fostering them to do what they're inclined to do and learn mm-hmm. what they're inclined to learn and perform in, in a way that makes them happy, right? Well, to create the optimal life so that they can contribute to society as they grow and create I think once you own who you are and you're doing what you love to do, you can be a leader. And without that, if you're just following everyone else, you're just a sheep. You're not going to be able to, to speak your voice and make that impact. And we definitely need more leaders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, there we go. There's our episode. Uh, thanks for tuning in. 
If you have any feedback, any comments, please reach out to us and hello at becomingdavinciShow.com. You can also visit us on our website at becomingdavinciShow.com. And if you have any hate mail, send it to Abe. At- <laughs> Definitely send it to Abe at... <laughs> I answer all my hate mail. Yeah. I, I should actually just go ahead and grab I hate Abe. Doc, I, <laughs> I, had, I hate Abe's voice.com. Absolutely. Anything else? <laughs> nope. That's awesome. Of course. Done. So we're going to put this out there. If you know anybody that should be covered on this show, please let us know. You know, we're looking for people that are innovative, you know, whether they have a business or not, maybe they're a school teacher, or maybe they're just that cool, um, grandma down the street that has just really figured out how to make amazing tomatoes grow in her backyard. So we're looking for self-directed learners. We're looking for innovators, uh, innovative people who are always learning and trying new things. So please reach out to us at hello at becomingdavinciShow.com. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Becoming Da Vinci Show. Join us next time as we learn more about Leonardo and modern day entrepreneurs. Becoming Da Vinci.